Hi, everyone. Welcome back to This Week in Immigration. I'm Jordan LaPierre. This week, the latest developments on family reunifications, a new rule on so-called public charges, and more changes to the immigration court system. All that just ahead. But first, remember, you can subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're at it, leave a review to help more people find this program. You can also stream This Week in Immigration on our website at bipartisanpolicy.org. And as always, check out bipartisanpolicy.org slash immigration for more information on the stories we discuss here on the show. More in a minute. Okay, so here with me today are Teresa Cardinal-Brown, Director of Immigration and Cross-Border Policy. Hi, Teresa. Hey, Jordan. And Chris Ramon, Policy Analyst. Hey, Jordan. So first today, Teresa, let's look at the latest round of court decisions and developments related to the efforts to reunite families separated at the border. This has been one of the biggest stories in immigration all summer. Yes. Um, Several courts have issued rulings forcing the government to reunite these families in different ways over the last few weeks. So can you walk us through those decisions and what they're exactly ordering the government to do? Sure. So the primary court case is a court case out in California. And the U.S. district judge out there had ordered the government to reunite the families that had been separated under the zero tolerance policy. And they were supposed to have reunited all of those families with children, all those eligible, by the end of last week. Uh, The government says they met that deadline, but there were still some 800 cases of people who may have been ineligible or the parents could not be located, or in some cases, about 400 of them or so, the parents had actually been deported without the children. So this is where that stands right now. The judge has said that, you know, he's, he, at the end of the day, was, was, impressed with the efforts the government did to try to reunite the families of the kids. The outstanding cases, questions are what to do about parents who had been deported without their children and um, what to do about the, 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 the parents that could not be located who may still be in the United States. The, the issue about the parents who had been deported is a complicated one. The government has offered uh, to try to see if they could locate the parents in the countries they've been deported to and ask if they want their child to be sent back to them in that country, essentially deporting the child back. The plaintiffs in the case are arguing that not all of those parents necessarily understood that when they were being deported, they were being going to be deported without their children. They may or may not have wanted their child with them, and they can't be sure because the government hasn't produced any evidence that said the parents actually agreed to be deported without the children. The, uh, the plaintiffs are also advocating that those who were deported should be allowed to come back to the United States to make those decisions. And the government has said, no, we don't necessarily want them to come back to the United States. The judge has indicated that he's not sure that that's the answer either. So that's a still very big sort of outstanding portion of this case. The thing to understand is all of this was under an injunction that required the government to reunite the kids. The underlying cases, the underlying court case about whether or not the government had the ability legally to do this in the first place, whether or not that policy of zero tolerance and the subsequent separation was legal still hasn't been determined. This has all been about the immediate desire to reunite families um, together after this. So there's still a lot to go on here. So simultaneously, though, the American Civil Liberties Union has filed a new lawsuit demanding that the government should give some of those parents whose asylum claims were initially rejected after being separated, another opportunity to apply for asylum. So why is the ACLU filing this lawsuit if the government rejected those claims the first time around? Sure. So when somebody arrives at the border and is subject to deportation, maybe because they've come in between the ports of entry, they're given an opportunity to say whether or not they have a fear of returning to their country. That gives them the ability to be interviewed by an asylum officer, a process called credible fear. And if they pass that interview that the government officer believes that they do have a credible fear of returning to their country and they have a likelihood of prevailing in an asylum case, they then can move on to appear before an immigration judge. So a group of parents and children who have been reunited, who are currently in immigration detention or are awaiting removal, say that they weren't able to successfully make their credible fear claim because they were, those interviews happened while they were separated from their children. And so the trauma of that separation, the emotional distress they were under, 
impacted their ability to make their credible fear case. And so that's what ACLU is arguing, that they should, they, even though they've been ordered deported, they should have another opportunity to make their immigration case for asylum because the impact of the separation adversely impacted their ability to make their case. Finally, some plaintiffs have filed another lawsuit against Attorney General Jeff Sessions' decision to overturn an immigration court case and make it harder for people to seek asylum um, in cases related to domestic violence. So what are the plaintiffs claiming in that lawsuit? In that lawsuit, it's really about interpretation of the statute. So as we talked about previously, Attorney General Sessions referred to himself a case of the Board of Immigration Appeals, the administrative appeals judges, if you will, for immigration court cases, had said that victims of domestic violence and some victims of criminal gang activity could qualify for asylum because they could be defined as a particular social group and that their impact of their domestic violence or crime was a form of persecution because the government couldn't protect them. That had been the case for a series of previous immigration administrative rulings that had been precedent. The, the attorney general took that case and overturned that and said, actually, it's not clear that this is a particular social group. These cases have not looked at whether or not the government really is able to offer protection or not. The fact that a local police force may not be able to control a criminal activity doesn't necessarily mean the government is condoning it and that domestic violence is essentially a private matter. So what it did was overturn those precedents to say that people who are claiming asylum based on domestic violence or criminal gang activity have a higher burden of proof to see if they actually make asylum. The ACLU case is saying, yeah, that's that's not really a correct interpretation of the underlying law, that if there is a case to be made that there is there is persecution on account of particular social group, and that his ability to just single-handedly overturn these, these years of precedent when a lot of people have relied on that is, is problematic. So again, they're, they're challenging that decision, and we'll see where that goes. Okay, thanks, Teresa. Let's turn now to the Trump administration's efforts to introduce a regulation that would make it harder for people who become so-called public charges to immigrate permanently to the United States. Teresa, I'll start with you here. I gather that this term public charge has a long and kind of interesting history. So walk me through where this term is coming from. Sure, so the original term public charge actually derives from like old British common law. And the idea of a public charge is someone who cannot support themselves economically and so has to rely on public support, whether that's governmental support or, or charity. In the early days of the United States, states, colonies, cities had the ability to restrict who could settle there if they believe that they weren't able to support themselves, if they might become a public charge and therefore have to lean on the public coffers, if you will. In response to, the, and it had various provisions in state-based immigration laws before the 1800s. In the mid-1800s, we had a large wave of immigration from Ireland. You remember the Ireland potato famine? And a lot of those Irish immigrants were rather poor. And so some of the states that were receiving them tried to pass these laws saying, you know, we, we don't need more poor people. We have enough of our own to deal with. Those state-based laws were overturned by the U.S. Supreme Court. And they, but they prevailed upon the federal government to pass a law in 1882 that first said that people who were likely to become a public charge were ineligible to immigrate. That terminology has persisted throughout immigration law up to the present day. The last significant revisions of that happened in the 96 Welfare Reform Act when President Bill Clinton signed a law passed by Republican Congress that limited in specific cases when immigrants could be eligible for federal benefits and required that a permanent resident, somebody who's a green card, couldn't be eligible for certain benefits until five years after they'd come in. So Chris, what does the word public charge mean in the current context and how does that impact immigration to the United States today? So in the current context, public charge kind of still carries a lot of the weight that Teresa was talking about, the historical weight. But now it's a lot more technical. When an individual wants to immigrate to the United States permanently or adjust status to the United States, one of the things that USCIS or consular officers will be looking at is whether or not they will become a public charge. But this is a lot more specific. What they really want to see is whether or not an individual will be reliant on cash-based benefits like supplemental security income, temporary assistance to needy families, and state and local cash assistance programs 
or that they actually might end up requiring long-term medical care at government expense. And if the consular officer or USCIS official looks at this, they might deem the individual inadmissible. Obviously, they can't you know, immigrate to the United States permanently because they would be a burden on the system. But like what the current term is, is applying to these two types of benefits. There are other types of benefits, public benefits, that won't be considered under this. So for instance, children's health insurance program, for instance, or non-supplemental incomes, what the, the category of these benefits is what they're called. That doesn't count towards that under the current definition of what public charge is. So that brings us to the Trump administration's work toward a new regulation that would alter this public charge rule in some significant ways. So how would this new effort um, shape the definition and application of that public charge rule? So I think first and foremost, I think what we should say is that a lot of this discussion is based on leaked drafts of this rule. And we right now we're talking about a hypothetical based on leaked drafts and the one that's been going through the regulatory revision process. Um, so that's an important thing to know up front. But the, the latest leaked draft stated that consular officers and USCIS officers would be considering benefit use not only by the individual, but by their dependents, which, which could also include U.S. citizen children, talking about the types of benefits that would fall into this. Non-cash benefits, like I was saying, children's health insurance program, Medicaid, supplemental nutrition assistance programs, so SNAP is what they're called. All these programs would be fit into that as to what the government would assess whether or not the individual would become a public charge. So they're essentially sort of expanding or at least hypothetically expanding the number of individuals who might fall under this broader category. And I think this is gonna have a lot of significant implications for the legal immigration system. Yeah, we're talking about a profound change to that legal immigration system that could impact the options that are open to many people who are moving to the United States in terms of whether they can stay permanently. So who exactly would be affected by this rule and what does research on the use of public benefits by non-citizens tell us about this group? Well, in terms of like the direct question, you know, the Migration Policy Institute did issue a study looking at what the latest leaked version of the draft would look like. And they were saying that the number of individuals who would face a public charge determination based on benefits use would increase from 3% to 47% under the current draft. Once again, it's the current draft, it's not the final draft. Wow. So it's going to be pretty expansive. But if you take a step back and you look at what the research is on public benefits use, a lot of these individuals who are using public benefits tend to be the elderly, tend to be children, um, people who obviously tend to be lower income. And so one of the things that this law would impact is that it would impact a lot of lower income individuals, particularly families. A lot of the research also shows that households that have immigrant children or U.S. citizen children, mixed status households, what they call them, or all immigrant households, tend to use these benefits at much higher rates compared to native born households. And so when you think about how this rule would be applied to, it would definitely be impacting those individuals, children, the elderly, households with mixed status, um, families and whatnot. Those would be the individuals who would be primarily affected by, by this proposed regulation. One more thing I just want to point out. Under this proposed rule, we're talking about legal immigrants. We're not, most undocumented immigrants are not eligible for any of these programs whatsoever. Right. And so this law, this proposed regulation is aimed at legal immigrants, many of whom are, are by law eligible for these benefits, but they, this regulation would put them in a choice of if I access these benefits for which I'm legally eligible, will that impact my future immigration status? And I think that's something that's new and a new angle on all of this. And we don't necessarily know how that will affect the choices by immigrants as to what benefits they will uh, apply for, for themselves or their family members. And, and part of this process of immigrating to the United States is also, especially through family sponsorship, which would probably take up a lot of the individuals who fall in, you know, who would have to go through a public charge test, is that when you're sponsoring somebody, you also need to sign an affidavit of support, meaning that you agree, and it's a legally binding contract with the U.S. government saying that I agree to sponsor this individual based on my financial income. And so there is a capacity for you when you're sponsoring to say, I will take responsibility for this. But once again, that's just simply one component. When you're looking at what this rule would do, it would directly be impacting a lot of individuals who want to move here legally. And like Teresa said, people will have this image of undocumented immigrants taking all these benefits, but we're talking about people who, are, who may already be here, who've already moved here, or planning on moving here, but 
uh, might find themselves in a little bit of dire straits if this regulation goes through in the form that we're seeing it right now. Okay, thanks. Finally today, the Justice Department continues to reshape the immigration court system. Last week, Attorney General Jeff Sessions issued an interim order that required immigration courts to use continuances for, quote, good cause shown. So, Teresa, what are continuances and why are those important for people who are going through the immigration court system? Sure. So continuances are basically when one of the parties in an immigration court case, either the government or the immigrant, would like to delay the next phase of their immigration court case for some reason. It can, it could be that they need to collect some more evidence, or it may mean that they don't have all the documents that they need to prove their case, or it may mean that somebody that needs to appear to support their case is not available until a later date. And the judge has the ability or has had the ability to issue a continuance. Oftentimes, this is a convenience the court, it can be a convenience to the government, but it can be very imperative, particularly for the immigrant. If particularly if an immigrant is unrepresented, maybe one of the reasons for continuance is so that they can get an attorney to help them. They may have asked the government for copies of their immigration records so that they can better make their case because immigrants don't necessarily have all the records the government does and the government hasn't given them the records. So they ask the judge for to continuance until they can get those records. The attorney general essentially said that he thinks that these continuances are unnecessarily lengthening the length of immigration court cases and adding further to the immigration backlog. And so in a case that he took, again, took to himself, he said that judges should only issue continuances when there is specific good cause, not just for the convenience of anybody, but there's a real reason that impacts the case for why the continuance should happen. So he's continuing to try to, if you will, define the realm of discretion that immigration judges have in courts. A previous decision he issued said that immigration judges can't just administratively close a case, which essentially takes it off the the deportation docket until the government refiles it at some point in the future. Uh, Judges had been able to do that when the immigrant couldn't be located or there was a problem with service or for any other reason the judge wanted. So the attorney general limited that discretion. Now he's saying you can't even you can't even give more time to the case unless there's a specific reason shown. So he's clearly trying to circumscribe the discretion that judges have. Yeah, so based on what you're saying, it sounds like this order is gonna make it harder for judges to allow respondents the opportunity to have more time just to prepare their case. So I'm wondering what the impact is gonna be for people who are going through the immigration court system and the challenges not only for folks before the court, but for the judges as well. Sure. So immigration, immigrant advocates, uh, immigration attorneys, even the Union for the Immigration Judges have all said that this is going to mean that probably more cases are just going to not have the full due process that they think they ought to have, that cases will be closed with even people who have good opportunity, good, good cases, but can't necessarily get things done in time. This is going to be particularly hard on people who are in detention. People who are in, detained have a much harder time finding an attorney, reaching out to get documents. They're just, they're in a a detention facility. So they don't have the freedom to make phone calls, to get on the internet, to talk to people, to go out and find all the information they may need. And so that tends to take a lot longer. So it'll probably most heavily impact those people in immigration detention. But yeah, there's been a lot of concern that it's going to impact the ability of, of people to make these cases. Because I think one thing to note that we've noted here in the past is that at least through the immigration court system, you don't have the right to an attorney. So unlike, say, a criminal case, you might at least get a public defender of some sort. Here you would need to be able to find an immigration on your own, and that's already half the battle in order to be able to maybe have a stronger case. Yeah. So one one regular type of continuance is if uh, an immigrant, for example, had an immigration attorney and that immigration attorney has to deal with another case and can't join the court. Mm. So they'd ask for a continuance and the judge may or may not be able to entertain that. Or if an immigrant had an attorney and that attorney could not no longer help their case, they want to have time to find another attorney. Well, again, uh, in a criminal court, the judge would easily allow that because you're entitled to an attorney. In immigration court, you're not necessarily entitled to an attorney. So the judge would be able to make a call and say, well, is having another attorney really going to help you? Again, it's constraining the the discretion of the judges to consider all those circumstances. Why is Sessions targeting continuances like this in the immigration court system? 
Yeah. So I mentioned earlier, like the uh, like the decision on administrative closure, it really appears that the attorney general is just trying to find ways to speed up the immigration court process. He's already increased the number of court case closings that immigration judges have to have each year to try to have them do more work and finish more cases in a year by dealing with continuances and administrative closures, he's looking at things that he thinks unnecessarily delay the immigration pro- immigration court decision process. Many people would argue that he's doing so because he wants to see more people deported. That's not how it's stated, but clearly the impact is to try to figure out how the immigration courts could do their jobs faster. And I think that kind of to wrap that up, we've you know, we've been doing a lot of research on what would be most effective and not effective in being able to tackle the backlog. And and goes back to seeing that the increase in the number of immigration judges, at least from our projections that we've done, tends to actually reduce this backlog a lot more significantly. So it, is, this a, is this papering over the issue of needing to hire more judges or not? That's a call that remains to be set, seen. But the thing is, certainly this is one of those other ways of trying to make the system speed up. But the, the underlying question of a balance between speeding up the whole process of getting through these backlogs, but also having giving individuals a fair hearing and allowing the system to work as it's intended to is always going to be one of those things that I think we'll be continuing struggling with as long as this backlog continues. Okay. Great point. Chris, Teresa, thanks for joining me. And thanks to you all for listening. And a special thanks as always to our producer, Emily Schrader. Uh, please take a second to find us on Facebook by searching Bipartisan Policy Center or on Twitter at BPC underscore bipartisan. And don't forget to subscribe and leave your feedback on this podcast on Apple Podcasts. Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Just search Bipartisan Policy Center. Join us again next time on This Week in Immigration. 